I have with me today Mr. Walter Pruden, who served part of his apprenticeship as a structural steel specialist during the construction of the Patello Bridge in New Westminster. I first met Mr. Pruden last November 1997, the 60th anniversary of the bridge. During his 40 years with the Dominion Bridge Construction Company, he worked on the construction of large buildings, boilers, and pulp and paper mills, besides bridges. During his retirement, he successfully completed the building of a steam-driven working model of locomotive number 374, which I'm sure he'll be glad to describe later on. One might say that Walter Pruden is a man of steel. Walter Pruden is being interviewed on Wednesday, March the 4th, 1998, at his home in Burnaby, B.C. The interviewer is Dick Ramsey. Well, Walter, I'd like to know, like many other people, uh, why this famous bridge was called the Patola Bridge. The Patola Bridge was named after the Premier of British Columbia, Duff Patello, and it was very appropriate for his name to be on the bridge, being the Premier of British Columbia and instrumental in arranging the uh, government finances so the bridge could be built at its location near Westminster. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter, how did you become associated with the, with the bridge? Well, I started my apprenticeship with the Dominion Bridge Company, Burnaby Plant, in 1936. I see. Uh, why, why was it really necessary uh, to build this bridge and at this particular location? The old railway bridge had a problem. It was too narrow and one way only, and long delays were necessary to get across. And in the summertime, this was very difficult for the cars uh, standing in the hot sun in the late afternoon. Um, radiators would boil and children would cry and people would get impatient waiting for their turn to cross the bridge. So that is why the emphasis began to have another bridge that would serve Westminster in a better way. Mm -hmm. uh, what were the steps in uh, building the bridge? Uh, you know, for example, determining the location, that type of thing. Would you have any information on that, uh, Walter? Well, it would begin with the municipal authority first for location of the site. And then the, the um, site engineering survey would be done to assure the, uh, the government that the bridge could be built at that location. Mm -hmm. Gosh, uh, there's more to this than I expected. Uh, what were your, uh, what were the steps, you might say, in building the bridge? What did they have to go through? To, uh, what sort of determinations were? Well, in the construction of any bridge, first is the decision of the design. And that is determined by the location and the financing of the uh, bridge. And from then on, it's a matter of uh, engineering designing of the particular design that was selected. And ongoing from there, where the bridge would be designed and the drawings would be made. And all the engineering information would be available to the contractor that uh, was successful in bidding to build a bridge. And happily, the company I work for, Dominion Bridge Company of Canada, were the contractor. I see. Well, what were your specific responsibilities? Uh, well, being an apprentice at that time, I was learning my trade, and uh, my work at that time was assisting the journeymen, layerouts and fitters, and working with them as an assistant in helping them with the various uh, things that they did, laying out the steel plates and uh, other members for the bridge. Would you have any idea, any rough idea, Walter, 
of the number of people who were involved in constructing this bridge. Yes, I would like to mention that we had just come through the period of unemployment, the hungry 30s as it was spoken of at that time, and it was a wonderful factor in creating employment for the area of Westminster and other places that would be involved with the construction of the bridge. And uh, Well, Walter, it, it seemed to me that there were quite a number of people employed in this project. Yes. Uh, in the Dominion Bridge plant in Burnaby, our uh, number of men approximately at that time was 350, and it possibly went up to about 600 as the work progressed. And uh, now the uh, number of people working at the site yes. would be considerably more uh -huh. uh, because of the involvement of uh, the river uh, work, uh, dredging before the uh, foundations could be uh, set in place, mm -hmm. and there's a tremendous lot of work that goes on mm -hmm. in uh, clearing the site mm -hmm. and uh, preparing for the foundations to be constructed. Mm -hmm. And in the Fraser River, where the two main piers were in the river itself, mm -hmm. um, caissons had to be uh, built and put in place to dewater the area where the foundation was going to be to permit the cement and the uh, clearing of the uh, actual foundation down to bedrock mm -hmm. so that uh, pilings could be mm -hmm. put in and then the cement work began in a dry situation right to the surface of the river. And once they've got above the surface of the water, then the, the, the protection from the water was not necessary and they could proceed right up to the level mm -hmm where the bridge uh, would land on the foundation. So when you combine the, the, the shop people and the site people, you've got a pretty husky number, all right. Yes. And that was a, that was a good thing, uh, in particularly in those days, uh, because as you said, it, it uh, provided for employment. But if, uh, uh, if money was scarce at the same time, uh, how could the government afford to pay? Yes. This? Well, there's an interesting thing on be behalf of the Dominion Bridge Company that as the uh, work progressed, the uh, payment for the work done was done in sections of the bridge completed. And uh, the first payment that became due to the Dominion Bridge Company was difficult for the government to come up with the full amount. So our company was fortunate in having enough resources to carry the work on so there wouldn't be any delay to the next time of payment. And the next section of the bridge was completed, and then the government was able to pay the first part and the second part, and then the work progressed and the government was able to continue on to the completion of the bridge with the finances. Well, the government of the day was very, very fortunate, I would say, in having such a benevolent company <laughs> to work with. Yes, the company had a wonderful <laughs> policy. Yes, and a marvelous reputation, I would imagine. A marvelous reputation of yeah. bridge building from the very start of the country, from the east to the west. Yeah. Well, just focusing on the bridge itself right now, uh, in general terms, uh, how, how would you uh, describe the architectural design of the, of the bridge? Uh, the architectural design of the bridge is what we call a tied arch span, and it was the most suitable for the location. The clearance and the cost was a factor of its design and the building of the bridge. I'm not an well, well, Walter, as far as you know, um, did it uh, present any uh, engineering problems during its construction? Yes. The, on the uh, south side, the main pier uh, was um, had to be a very deep excavation to uh, get the pilings in place. And uh, there was a difficulty there uh, because at the time, uh, the, the construction of the dewatering process, which we call the caisson, um, the river uh, current was very swift and it gave them quite a problem. Mm -hmm. And then later on, after the pier had been uh, finished, 
ready for the bridge, and the bridge uh, work had started, and uh, the uh, freshet, which is the high level of the Fraser River from the runoff of the interior. That's the springtime, I guess. In the springtime, yeah, they yeah. call it the freshet. Yeah, huh. The river flows very swiftly, and the turbulence that it created around the South Pier started to undermine it. And the great concern about the stability of the pier was coming into uh, view. And uh, so the decision was to uh, bolster the pier by large rocks, which were brought in large scows and dumped all around the pier to secure it from this freshet, high swift current that was occurring. And it did prove effective, and the bridge is sound today. Gosh. Well, you know, you mentioned freshet. I just might, it just reminded me of my, 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 sorry, my, my father uh, lost a boat in the Fraser. A boom broke loose from Fraser Mills. Oh, yes. And uh, the boat was at the bottom of the, uh, the, the foot of the uh, Burnett River. Uh, yes. What we called the Packing House Creek in those days. Yes. <laughs> and it, it went down, the boat went down to the bottom. Yes. Uh, anyway, that enough of my story. Where did you stop it? No, no, we're we're, we're, we're recording that just to make it sound <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Uh, follow some very interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, now uh, something else that appears to me that the, uh, were there any specific features would you say about this wonderful bridge, Walter, that uh, in your opinion might make it unique? Yes, as bridges are constructed, sometimes um, owing to the span and. Um, the location, they'll use what they call false work, which is temporary supports while the bridge is erected across the, uh, the river or wherever it goes. Now, in this case, this design, the tide arch span, allowed the bridge to be erected across the river without false work, and uh, which was a, a very beneficial thing because in the river where the uh, the bridge was built is a very sandy, muddy situation, and to put false work in the river to support the bridge temporarily would have been very, very difficult. So the tide arch design made it so the bridge could be constructed across without the support. The bridge itself held itself up until it was joined together. Gosh. Uh, I feel as if I'm having a very good course in bridge construction here. Uh, were, were there any uh, accidents, uh, shall we say, deaths that, uh, or and or deaths that occurred uh, during the bridge's construction, yeah. Walter? Well, to my knowledge, there was only one serious accident where a man fell off the bridge into the water and was drowned, mm -hmm. and this occurred at the south side of the bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, other accidents uh, possibly were not reported of them being in minor in, in uh, incident. Yeah. But otherwise, as far as I know, there was only one yeah. loss of life on the bridge. See. Well, that's a remarkable record when you take into consideration the number of people who were employed and also the treacherous uh, characteristics of, of the river. Uh, well, <clears throat> I don't know if it'd be nice if you all all right to end on a note, this note on death, or, uh, or anything of that nature, but so would, can you think of anything else that you'd uh, like to uh, add to this uh, discussion yes. or interview, I should say? Yes, I would like to say that uh, at this time when the bridge was uh, being built, if the finances of the government could have permitted, it should have been a six-lane bridge and uh, history proves that uh, as soon as the bridge was opened and it got to be used, it soon was used to its fullest capacity, and it has been at that ever since. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, that mistake seems to be made all the time, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, you talked about the, the, the opening of the bridge. I understand that there's, there's a sort of a unique opening. Could yes. you fill us in on the details of that, Walter? Yes, <laughs> I'd be very glad to, ah. because uh, it's... Um, quite interesting to me and an honor to me to discuss this. The opening celebration, an item was cutting a chain link 
by the premier, Duff Patello, the man that guided the premier's hand with the cutting torch was a welder named Harry Daly, who became the chief welding inspector for the Dominion Bridge Company. And I have the honor of having his job on his retirement in 1966. My retirement came in June of 1976, 40 years with the same company, Dominion Ridge Company, Burnaby Plant. And it's unusual today to hear of anybody working for 41 years, 40 years for one company. It just doesn't happen anymore. Five years is a long time for anyone to be with one company. They go broke, they have the wrong computer, they get into financial <laughs> difficulties. The computer and computer. that's the ongoing story <laughs> we right. hear today. That's, uh, people are changing jobs very rapidly yes. today. And I'd just like to add, yes. a very significant picture is in the New Westminster Key oh. uh, of the uh, incident of the opening of the bridge. Oh, yes. And the man that's holding the torch mm -hmm. for... Duff Patello mm -hmm. is the man named Harry Daly, ah, yes. who was an excellent welder and became the chief welding inspector for the Dominion Bridge Company. Well, Walter, it's, it's been a wonderful experience for me to hear all these uh, details. And uh, Now, you are retired, and I, as I mentioned in the introduction, you uh, built a steam-driven locomotive. Uh, would you like to tell us about that and the significance of that uh, locomotive? Yes. Besides the significance of your yes. master work. <laughs> well, I became interested in the locomotive CPR number 374, which was the first engine to bring passengers from Port Moody to Vancouver. And that was 111 years ago today. It was May the 23rd, 1887, at about 11 o'clock. It arrived in Vancouver, decorated with all sorts of flags and pictures of the Queen and uh, dignitaries of all kinds were there. And the dress of the day was top hats and dark suits. And there's a wonderful picture of that. And uh, I became interested in this Engine 374, which had been preserved and is still in existence in the uh, area of Vancouver at Davy Street and Pacific in the roundhouse that was called the CPR Drake Street Roundhouse. And that engine was there uh, for Expo, and it was on the turntable, and it was on display with its whistle blowing and bell ringing and steam being emitted from the cylinders, and it was a great show for the Expo, 1986 Expo. And uh, Evelyn Atkinson, the uh, lady that was a Parks Board Commissioner, and when the engine was on display on Kitsilina Beach, it was deteriorating. It was being vandalized. The scrap hunters were taking every piece of brass off it, and the windows were getting broken, and it was deteriorating from the salty air of the English Bay. Gosh. So Evelyn Atkinson was instrumental in getting the Parks Board and the City of Vancouver to consider restoring the engine. Mm -hmm. uh, being such a significant artifact oh, of yes. railwaying in the history of Canada. Absolutely. And, it, and so anyway, at that time in 1987, the celebration of May 23rd was to be done, and Evelyn Atkinson wanted a steam engineer with a ticket to fire up the auxiliary boiler, which was provided by a wonderful man named Bob Swanson, railway inspector, for the government of British Columbia. And uh, so uh, she contacted me to, to uh, find a man who would do this job. So I did know a man named Edward Bittner who went to school with me and became a steam engineer and worked all his life at steam engineering. I contacted him and asked him if he would like to do this in starting this engine up again for the celebration of May 23rd. He told me, he said, Walter, I've worked all my life at steam. And he said, I've had enough steam. He said, I have a beautiful garden, and that's where I want to work. <laughs> he said, you could do it as well as I could. Oh, boy. It's fully automatic, not requiring an engineer's ticket. Uh -huh. And 
all you do is fill the boiler with water and turn on the electricity and it will make steam. <laughs> That's all you do, eh? <laughs> so I went back and told Evelyn. I was so And she said, well, Walter, you're the engineer. And I've been that ever since. I decided to build a scale model of this very significant artifact. Yes. And I have done it. And it took me four years to do it. And uh, you, I was warned by the, the engineers and people that build models that you must consider your wife as much as you consider the engine, <laughs> or you or the <laughs> engine will go, Aye, or true. your wife will go. True enough. <laughs> so I was fortunate having a sympathetic wife, oh, boy. and it took me four years. We completed it. Wonderful. And the engine today is a wonderful thing to see, and it runs just like the big engine would run. Yeah. Well, That's it. the story of 374. That's a remarkable story. Walter, you say it still runs. Where do you run this engine? Well, its home is Confederation Park in Burnaby oh, yeah. on Willingdon, north of Hastings. Uh -huh. And this park is developing now to become the greatest park of model railway clubs. Mm -hmm. And in the year 2000, there will be the World Expo of Railway Clubs coming to Vancouver and to Confederation Park. Good. And it will be a great show for everyone to see. You know, Walter, I'm almost certain that when some people think of a working model engine, they could conceivably be thinking of a tabletop model. Well, your model is far from that. Could you give me a, a word picture, you might say, of your locomotive model 374? Nothing too technical now, uh, but, uh, you know, simply the... The length, the width, the height, the weight, the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just so that we can form in our minds a picture of what you've actually done. Model engine 374 is a one-eighth scale model of the original engine CPR 374, which is the full-size engine that pulled the first passenger trains into Vancouver. And uh, this model is an exact one-eighth scale of its full size and it does everything that the full size engine would do in uh, steaming and running and running back and forth and everything and it looks as near as possible to the original thing but it's only one-eighth of the original size and it weighs with the tender some 900 pounds and it's um, nine foot eleven long overall with tender and engine and the highest point of the engine is 24 inches to the top of the smokestack and the wheel configuration is what they call a 440 and that's the definition of an engine with four pilot wheels and four drive wheels now when you talk about locomotives that's how they describe the driving wheels, by the number of pilot wheels, number of trailing wheels, and the number of drive wheels are always lifted in order from front to rear. Now, the engine has uh, a steel boiler with uh, uh, copper tubes in it, which is the same as it would be in a big boiler, a big engine, and the cylinders are two inches in diameter, and the stroke is two and five-eighths, and the drive wheels are eight inch in diameter, which if calculated from the original size would be one-eighth of the original size. The um, cow catcher, which is a large one for this type of engine built in the 1800s, and that's what it was. It kept animals off the track so the engine wouldn't be derailed when they happened to run over them. And um, all the other things, the bell and the whistle, and uh, the cab, the controls, which consist of the same, exactly the throttle is the same as the large engine would have, and um, a lever-operated throttle. The um, reversing gear, which we call the Johnson bar on the old type steam engines, and you can move this bar forward, and the engine, you open the throttle, and your engine will start to move forward. And uh, when you stop, you shut your throttle off and you bring your Johnson bar to the middle position, which is neutral. 
Now, when you wish to go in reverse, you bring the Johnson bar back and then open your throttle and your engine should start to go in reverse. Now, the Johnson bar has a series of notches in it which can control the amount of steam into the cylinders by the different position of the valve controlled by this Johnson bar. And there's what they call the company notch, which is the most efficient notch, and it saves steam and it saves coal for the company. That's why they call it the company notch. <laughs> the engineers try to run the engine when they can in the company notch. So there's a little information well, that hardly well, anybody knows about. That's true, Walter, and it certainly provides a very clear picture of uh, what you've done, and congratulations. Uh, I, you know, I've, I think that's wonderful, just wonderful. Now, Walter, uh, would there be any other gems of interest you uh, would like to uh, share with me? Yes, I would like to uh, now describe my association with a young fellow that went to school with me named Jack Lubzinski. And uh, he and I uh, were great pals, and we lived in Richmond, Lula Island, now called Richmond City. And he didn't live too far from me. He was on number two road. And I was on number two roads as well, and we were about uh, two miles apart. So we saw each other fairly often, him and his brothers, and uh, we had a great time together doing all the things that young fellows do at that time, and uh, exploring the rivers and uh, going around. And uh, uh, Jack was a very interesting fellow, always interested in something new and something new. So when the Patilla Bridge was completed, his interest was aroused by the wonderful picture of it on a sunny day that you could sit on the river bank of the Fraser River and admire this wonderful bridge. And so he got the idea that he'd like to make a model of it. So in order to make a model, you have to get the correct scale so it'll look right. So he spent a lot of time sitting on the, on the edge of the river there uh, making sketches, thumbnail sketches as you might call them, so that he could build his model which he did. He built it out of cedar and possibly other types of wood with a pen knife and a chisel and whatever it took to do it <laughs> and finally completed it. It's 20 feet long approximately and the model was so uh, well done in, in detail in every way that the government was attracted to the model and uh, wished to recognize it and they had it in the archives in Victoria for a considerable time until um, the, the archives was revised and they needed the space for another uh, uh, artifact of some kind and so the uh, bridge was moved to Westminster and I understand now it is in the archives of Westminster and it's there for display possibly in the future and it would be a wonderful thing for it to be displayed and uh, I'm sure my friend Jack Lubinsky would be well honored by anything that's done with the bridge. Well, that's a remarkable story. It truly is because I don't think too many people know about this and uh, apparently it is in the the, uh, the basement of the of the uh, uh, of the museum archives in U.S. Minister, uh, and uh, they might be putting it on display again. Yeah. But that, that's wonderful. I, I, uh, I think that's just grand. And it's a, how old would, would he be when he made this? You think? How old would oh, Jack be? He would be, be about, um, oh, between 14 and 16. <laughs> yeah. It must have See? took him a, a, quite a long yeah. time to do it yeah. when you look at the detail oh, yeah. of what yeah. Yeah. that bridge consists yeah. of yeah. Yeah. it's not just a simple yeah. no. uh, bridge no. being a, a suspended you like arch the scale span and detail. a mm -hmm. lot involved in, in yeah. the uh, vertical members of the bridge mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. well thank you that's, that's very good all right we're back in business again uh, I'm just going to ask uh, Jack if he could tell us uh, just what Jack is doing today. Would you have any idea about that? Uh, yes, uh, my friend Jack Lubinsky is still a very active fellow, and uh, he's like myself, uh, possibly retirement age, and uh, he has a, a business, both he and his brother Joe, 
they make uh, beautiful steering wheels for yachts and other ships uh, big enough for the BC ferries and uh, made out of imported hogget mahogany and uh, the beautiful uh, wheels when they're finished and some people have bought them to make chandeliers out of them and put lights on them and uh, their business is uh, going according to the demand sometimes they have a big order sometimes not many but they do that and they have a little plant and they work at it and also jack uh, goes to the university and he's taken up different subjects there and uh, there has been a time when he has taught some of the subjects that he has taken up and now he's uh, i think doing further studies and uh, to enlarge his uh, his uh, knowledge and uh, that's what he's doing he mm -hmm. goes to university every day and, uh, but not all day and some days and uh, sometimes not mm -hmm. for a full week at a time mm -hmm. But between that and his job with his brother making these steering wheels, mm -hmm. he's quite an active fellow mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. enjoys life quite yes, well. He, well, he certainly sounds, seems to be a remarkable person. Uh, I, uh, if he, uh, if he made that uh, model shortly after the bridge was constructed, and he's around 14 to 16 years of age, that means that. He's, uh, he's not a young man anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and is, is he still in Richmond? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Walter. Uh, would you have anything else you'd like to add to this uh, story about the, the bridge and your experiences with it or anything else? Is there anything else that comes to your mind? Well, it'd be my hope that when the first Naras bridge problem is solved, uh -huh. that the uh, existing bridge could be... Uh, improved so it would be a four-lane bridge uh -huh. by putting the sidewalks on the outside of the girders and designing it so it would not suffer from wind area dynamics which they have to uh -huh. provide for a bridge like the uh -huh. first narrows bridge which is a cable suspended bridge uh -huh. and uh, that would solve the problem to a great deal and not have to interfere with the park and yeah. and whatever by making that bridge a four-lane bridge, which can be done by putting the yeah. sidewalks on the outside of the girders. Yeah. And that's my hope for the bridge well, that I started work on in 1936 uh -huh. at the tender age of 15 uh -huh. going on 16. Uh -huh. I see. So all the best to the future of the bridge. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's wonderful. And I think that's a grand suggestion you have, and I hope they do something about it and follow your line of reasoning closely. Now, that, that makes me think of another point that was mentioned. Uh, previous in the interview, you said uh, if finances permitted it, the Patola Bridge should have been a six-lane bridge. Uh, it is now presently a four-lane bridge, isn't that correct? Do you think it would be feasible in any way to widen the Patola Bridge, to turn it into six lanes, uh, 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 or even eight lanes, if possible? To yeah. Because those four lanes presently are very narrow also, and uh, would you think that would be a feasible thing to do with this bridge? Well, in the case of the Patola Bridge, to increase its capacity, the design of the bridge is such that it's designed to carry the maximum load of a four-lane bridge. Ah, yeah, I see. And uh, to redesign the uh, bridge so that it could take two more lanes, making it a six-lane bridge, would uh, necessitate uh, redesign of the uh, supporting structure, the arch and the, the yeah. deck and... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all involved with that mm -hmm. and then you'd have to look at the foundations mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. to see that the, yeah. the, the load factor would be taken yeah. care of by the existing yeah. foundations yeah. and a considerable amount of money yeah. Yeah. would be required yeah. to, to do all that mm -hmm. well <clears throat> yeah, it could be a problem all right well because as i think as, as you mentioned that the, the traffic on the bridge is quite heavy right now you know when the bridge opened if I remember correctly, there was a toll charge, wasn't there, for the bridge? Yes. Yeah. Do you, can you remember just what that would be? Yes. Well, there was uh, uh, the toll, and of course, uh, the uh, premier 
and got the benefit of that, and they call it the Paytolo Bridge. <laughs> so it had a nickname at the very start. Paytolo Bridge, yes, I remember that well. I forgot about that, actually. Thank you for reminding me. The Paytolo Bridge. How did he react to that? Did he, did he think that was pretty good publicity for himself or not? Any publicity? Oh, I, publicity? I think it, uh, <laughs> it, it didn't do him any harm. No. <laughs> and uh, the bridge was yeah. finally paid for, and uh, everybody was happy with it. And uh, it's a wonderful bridge. Yeah. And uh, it just uh, it's in the right place yeah. at the time, and it still is doing a great service to the city of Westminster and the, the Surrey area. And uh, it's, it's doing a great job. Well, Walter, uh, truly, I'd, I'd like to thank you for this uh, uh, very enlightening and, I would say, uh, highly informative interview. Uh, it is obvious that uh, you are certainly committed to your calling, if I may say so, and to the uh, company that gave you the experiences. And uh, for a, a man who stayed 40 years on the same job and was given and during the retirement years, a very responsible position, you certainly should be congratulated. Thank you very much. Walter gave me some additional information about his background, and we agreed to record it at this time. Walter was born in Liverpool, England in 1919, July the 19th, actually. His parents moved to Richmond, B.C. in 1922, and that is where Walter was raised. They moved to Vancouver in 1945. Walter was married in 1946 to Ione and lived near Queen Elizabeth Park. Walter and Ione now live in the Lougheed village in Burnaby and are enjoying a well-deserved retirement.